Hi, my name's Carl Wilkins, and, well, that might work. We moved to Rwanda in 1990. It was actually the second time we had lived in Africa. And um, we were pretty excited. We're coming to this peaceful little beautiful country in the center of Africa. We're gonna build schools and operate clinics. It was, it was really rewarding, exciting work there as we landed on the ground. Peaceful little place, I can't say that enough. You know, people called it this little Eden in the middle of Africa. Our life um, was very comfortable. We lived in the capital city of Kigali and um, I stayed at home with our children and our kids, uh, their ages were at that time six, four, almost two. And uh, Carl began work with uh, ADRA, the organization that had asked us to come there, Adventist Development Relief Agency. And our lives were very similar to what we might have had if we lived back in the States. Um, we learned our way around town to get to the grocery store, to get to to church to get um you know we just had a very a very um peaceful life when when we got to rwanda there's always people who are eager to tell you about the country and they told us about tutsis who had fled and there was rumors of them coming back like a military and we're like okay you know every story every country has its story and things um but we didn't think much about it and and as we worked we knew some people who to tutsi but i mean they were speaking the same language they worked together they married each other all the time so we really didn't think it was a, a major deal well, we were only in the country for about six months before the war started and we wondered wow what's this going to mean you know and people even started talking about evacuating in 1990 but we soon adjusted to kind of war life although soon a couple a landmine showed up in kigali on one of the dirt roads and so you'd head to work in the morning and you're like wow uh, am I the first one on the road this morning? Did somebody put a landmine last night? So there was this little bit, well, landmines maybe more than a little bit, in, in the back of your mind about what's going on. But still, you adjust. And you know, so we had three years of war, and, and even um, towards the end of the war, when the international community put pressure on Rwanda to have multi-partyism, um, there started to be more random acts of violence in Kigali. We'd hear an explosion. I'm sitting in the living room. Uh, I've got my daughter on my lap reading a story before going to bed and, and an explosion somewhere in the distance is there. She doesn't jump, I don't jump. She just kind of goes, ah, when is this gonna end? So it's kind of kind of crazy when you look back how much we adjusted to those tensions and things that were mounting. So right before, um, before the actual shooting down of the plane, things were very tense. Um, the, we had taken the weekend, previous weekend was Easter weekend, we had gone uh, to the the lake, Kibu, um, had a nice quiet weekend, Carl's parents were visiting with us. We wouldn't have dreamed of, of the, of what was going to happen within the next few days. So in a way it was like a shock, in another way um, things had been building up, We had, you know, the tensions had been there, so it was a mixture of shock and and not total surprise. Immediately, there was gunfire right in our neighborhood, not across the valley, not somewhere behind another hill of the city, right there in our neighborhood. And then you're hearing screams and pounding, and it's like, this is, this is, um, this is something we've never experienced before. Friday, the embassy is saying, no, we're leaving, we're all leaving, and you can't bring any Rwandans with you. We're going to meet at the assembly points, the ambassador's home, the, the international school, but don't bring any Rwandans. Doesn't matter if they're Hutu or Tutsi. We, we get to the roadblocks, there'll be problems. And so that's really when Therese and I are, you know, uh, thinking, whoa. Um, I, we had thought about me somehow trying to help people you know, during a time of crisis and problem, but now it was right there in our house. There's two people in our home that have Tootsie ID cards. A young lady who lives and works there and a young man caught there in the evening as the watchman and the plane shot down at night, he's caught there in the house. And so when the embassy says you can't bring anybody with you, um, any Rwandans with you, uh, we're like, well, well, we can't just leave these people here to be killed in our house.
It was finally three weeks before the government gave permission for anybody to come out and get a travel permit if they had a good reason for one. So I left the house, had to go through several roadblocks, but we finally made it. And I met this guy, Colonel Renzaho, who was in charge of the city and um, seemed like a really nice guy. He was actually wondering, where are you staying at night? He actually seemed concerned for my safety. And I explained, you know, I explained I was the director of ADRA. I want to somehow help the people who are suffering. And of course, we're not going to have a conversation about Hutu and Tutsi or anything, but how can we help the people who are suffering? And he's like, yeah, um, you bet. I, there's, there's, um, and he told me about a Frenchman who had stayed. You could help there. And then we have an orphanage out in the Yummy Rambo, this one. And, and so um, he prepares, has his secretary prepare a travel permit, signs it and stamps it. And I'm like, okay, thank you, you know. And uh, that paper, I, I, I really wish I still had it because that paper was really a ticket to, um, to get around through the roadblocks. You show up at a roadblock, you show them this paper, there's the guy's signature and his stamp on there, and they still would usually hassle me one way or another, but in the end, I knew I was gonna get through because of that paper. I, I could even get to places where the UN couldn't go because the UN didn't have that kind of a travel permit. And um, it was interesting how these relationships um, really did start to make it possible to do something in what appeared to be a very hopeless time. One of the orphanages, actually the biggest orphanage that the Colonel sent me to was operated by a Rwandan man named Damas Kasimba. And uh, I had actually never met him before the genocide. As I came in the parking lot, I saw graves in the parking lot. I meet Damas, I shake his hands. I'm just wondering what's going on here, you know? And, and Damas tells me, I thought they'd been children maybe slaughtered. And he's like, no, these children have died from diarrhea. We are, we are without water here. We are in big trouble. And, and I started to find out, well, how many do you have? And you know, well, normally we have 80, but it's growing every day. More kids are more coming. By the time the genocide's over, he'll have more than 400. Damas had people working with him like Trifine. There was this on-the-job trained nurse who was incredible. I would, I would bring her medicine and she would almost drop to her knees and use words like angel or something, you know. And I'm like, no, you're the angel. I don't know how you're doing this, you know, taking care of these children who have some of them seen their parents killed. I don't know when you sleep at night and, and then they're sick on top of that and you don't have water to get or food and they're hungry and simple things, this lady. Then I find out that she's also being... I don't know forced but 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 the killers would bring their wounded people to her people who get wounded in the process of making these kids orphans and she's somehow disinfecting and treating them and um I I you know as I look back on on her I mean, you know, I look back on Damas and I'm like, I don't know how Damas did it. And then you look at the people who were part of his team and you look like, that seems, I don't know how they did it. You know, how did this lady, how could she stand to touch the people who were killing and, and stuff? And yet, you almost kind of to believe that the answer to how they did it was that they were together, you know, and, and they were drawing off of each other, the, the strength to, to be able to to continue each day, never knowing when it's going to end and, and how bad it's going to be. You know, I was there not long ago and I met with about 40 people who had been hiding there. You know, one guy was two years old and now he's about to graduate from university with an IT degree. Quiet, you know, soft-spoken, nice kid. And, and, and another lady, young mom at the time. And now I said, so what do you do? And she says, I'm a, I'm a wedding planner. And I'm like, whoa, that's cool. What, how? Tell me about it. And she says, well, and she reaches in her little cloth bag and pulls out an iPad. Let me show you some of my weddings. And she kind of starts flicking through the pictures. And, um, and yet at the same time, we took, um, we took a lady, we gave a lady a lift afterwards. And um, yeah, she's still struggling, you know, as a single mom with her kids. So it's, it's not like it's all happily ever after by any means. You know, I, I was able to talk to Carl every single day of the genocide, except I think we decided there was one day, as I'm thinking back in my memory, that we did not talk on the radio. But to be able to talk every single day was huge. I didn't hear a lot of the actual um, different events that were going on. Um, I didn't hear, you know, talk of, we didn't talk about the people that were dying. We didn't talk about, um, 
you know, the different places that were being attacked. We talked more about what he was doing, you know, taking water to the orphans and helping people in our neighborhood who were injured. He eventually got supplies from the Red Cross Hospital and was making house calls around our neighborhood to, to help the injured. Being able to, to talk with each other, to know he was still alive each day, and he, he has often told me that having someone outside that, um, he, well, knowing that we were okay too is, I think, a relief to him. Once the candle's out and you're laying there in the dark, you're thinking about your family, you know, and um, it's going to happen. One day we're going to be able to be together again. You just hang on to that. And, and I did. I believed it. I, I, I believed I would. But then when it happened, you know, when the war was over, the genocide is stopped and the RPF stops the genocide and, and um, it's quiet at night and finally I got to get in uh, and I'm looking all around in this Canadian transport plane. Everybody's so disciplined and they each have their tasks and duties and it's kind of like, whoa, it's kind of strange to be in such a disciplined, structured environment after being in such a chaotic, destructive environment. I was really shocked. They let down the steps in the cargo plane and you come out and the warm air there and the tarmac and all of a sudden there they are, you know, just a hundred yards away or something and just went running. And, and of course, you know, the kids are running and, and um, it, it, as you look back on it, it seems somehow surreal. And yet um, to wrap your arms around them, to feel that, that, you know, it's real. It's real, and, and um, kids were full of questions and stuff. But, you know, and I, and I look at Teresa, and, and I'm like, you know, well, you know, initially, how did you do it? How did you get here on the tarmac? But the bigger question is, how did you do the whole thing? You know, how did you hold things together and um, help the kids know it's going to be all right? You know, and, and, and that behind the scenes role is so often missed. It's, it's neglected. You know, we, we look at the people who are right up front when we talk about upstanders or, or, you know, resisting against these horrible things. But there's like a multitude of people behind them who, who are making it possible for them to do it. And for each of us to understand our role and to appreciate those roles, you know, I often think, ah, I didn't appreciate enough. And it's like, I can't say it enough now, you know, how much. I appreciate what she did. About the idea of not standing by, I think um, the, the main thing that might stop a person from doing anything, at least as I look at my own, my own within myself, um, is a fear. And um, I think that if we can learn to move past our fear, and one thing we've discovered through our experience is that if you have a mission, if you have something, a job to do, that can really help be a um, antidote for, for fear. It can help you forget the fear, or at least put it aside, and to just keep on that mission. When I think about don't stand by, the first thing I shouldn't, the first thing I should not think is about somebody else doing something. The first thing I should think is about my reaction. And then maybe I make a choice that I think is a good choice. That doesn't mean that the other person was supposed to make that choice. Every one of us is, is uniquely made and we've come with different stories and different experiences. And so I think the best way to encourage not standing by is modeling it ourselves.